Welcome to the sixth lecture in preparation for the study trip to Torun and Malburg, uh, crossing medieval Prussia. Today we're going to be talking about the ultimate uh, decline and collapse of the state of the Teutonic Knights, uh, focused around the run-up to the Battle of Tannenberg, also called the First Battle of Grunwald, uh, not to be confused with the Second Battle of Grunwald, World War I. How can this powerhouse uh, be defeated? Uh, the rise of the state of Teutonic Knights seems, uh, or may well have seen to contemporaries, even as inevitable uh, from the uh, mid-13th century onwards, once they put down the uh, uh, major Prussian rebellions of the uh, 1260s into the 1270s, and the situation comes under control. There's heavy German uh, colonization. In fact, the, the very language of the, the so-called peasantry is shifting to to uh, low German across this period, and it just seems like uh, this is going to be a permanent fixture of the political landscape. But in fact, uh, by the end of the 16th century, uh, it was uh, uh, well and truly a thing of the past. Well, uh, you have a series of battles. Uh, you have the Battle of Grunwald on 15 July 1410, uh, which is lost by the Teutonic Knights. Uh, at that battle, uh, the knights fielded probably around 15,000 fighters and a uh, newly formed union of Poland and Lithuania fielded around 25,000. And I'm going to talk about each of these items in detail uh, through the course of this lecture. But note here uh, the uh, uh, army, the combined army of Poland and Lithuania uh, was uh, around about double that of the Teutonic Knights. And so that's the uh, kind of real point to watch as we go through the lecture, how do Pol the Poles and the Lithuanians end up working together? Because it's that union that leads to the destruction of the Teutonic Knights. The Battle of Grunwald, about uh, 210 of 270 knights uh, are killed. Keep in mind, every knight's backed up by various helpers, retainers, and mercenaries, and that's how the army uh, forms up at over 15,000. After the Battle of Grunwald, uh, there's a siege of the uh, castle of Malburg, the capital of the state, the Teutonic Knights. Uh, so uh, the Polish army eventually withdraws, and that's uh, effectively a draw. And then there's a, another battle, uh, the Battle of Kornovo uh, uh, in, uh, or the Battle of Crowns in October 1410, uh, with the Teutonic Knights uh, around 44,000, mostly mercenaries, those that are left over, are uh, defeated again. This all leads to the so-called First Peace of Thorn, uh, agreed from uh, between 1410 and 1411. Uh, this series of catastrophes in the first part of the 15th century tip the trajectory of the Teutonic Knights from one of ascendance and growing power to one of, of uh, slow, steady deterioration up until the end uh, of the formal existence of the order after the Peasants' War of 1525. Well, the best way to approach this problem is to think about the geography of the state of the Teutonic Knights and what we might call the uh, what we might call the Overland problem. So, have a look at my red laser pointer here, and you'll see that the uh, State Teutonic Knights in Prussia comprises this area of land here in the South Baltic, uh, just north of Poland, and the Livonian uh, part of the State Teutonic Knights uh, is up here in the northeast, and they're separated by this land called Samogintia, which is sort of semi-independent, it's pagan, and it's uh, under the protection, if you would, of the, the uh, Grand Duchy of Lithuania. Uh, it's not entirely accurate to say so, but for our purposes, let's just call it part of Lithuania. So the two major components of the State of Titan Knights are separated uh, by this spur of territory here, uh, Samogintia, which is under the protection of the Lithuanians. And it extends right out to the coast uh, for the most part. Now, this map uh, shows here a little spit of land connecting the two areas of Teutonic control. But that 
area of control right here at the tip of Samagentia would not be in the possession of the Teutonic Knights for very long. And it, it's the continuous desire of the Teutonic Order to hammer away at these pagan Samagintians and try and join up their territory uh, that would eventually uh, spur them into, you know, spur the Lithuanians into a conflict with the Teutonic Order in which they would uh, join with the Poles. So let's uh, begin with the so-called Lithuanian Crusade. By the time we get to the early 14th century, the Lithuanians are the only remaining pagan people uh, in Europe, certainly the only remaining pagan peoples in the Baltic area. Early in 1305, the Teutonic Knights uh, lead raids uh, on lands uh, around the ne River Niemen uh, during the course of the winter. The Teutonic Knights had two raiding seasons, and this is part and parcel of a very long history of warfare in the Baltic region. In the summer, when the weather is relatively hot and dry, when the largest number of Western Crusaders uh, uh, are available, the Teutonic Knights would, would make summer raids uh, against the Lithuanians and any other enemies they might have, any rebellious subjects, for example. During the winter, they would normally run a series of smaller raids that would happen kind of January, February time when the soil, uh, and particularly uh, the water, water and lakes of inland areas, is completely froze up hard so that you can move from place to place across the frozen earth, across frozen ponds and lakes uh, without uh, difficulty. So these are your two raiding seasons. Uh, this pattern of warfare uh, around the Baltic is one that goes all the way back to kind of Viking times, you know, in, in the 8th, 9th, 10th century. And it's carried on uh, by the Teutonic Knights. It's dictated by the environment and the, the cycles of the seasons. Now, uh, nearly annual attacks happen on Samagintia, both in the summer and in the winter. <coughs> Excuse me. During the course of the so-called Lithuanian Crusade, and I want to stress that that term Lithuanian Crusade applies broadly to a period from the late 13th century all the way up to 1410 and the, the uh, Battle of Tannenberg or Grunwald. But during the course of the Lithuanian Crusade, there are various attempts of the Lithuanians to uh, seek out the aid of other peoples in the area. Uh, the Poles, uh, the Estonians, for example, who haven't yet converted to Christianity. And one of the great sort of figures in this uh, uh, the ongoing attempt to keep Lithuania uh, ticking over, and here on the right we have an illustration, a 16th century illustration of the Lithuanian capital of uh, Memel here. Or, sorry, I apologize. Memel's not the capital of Lithuania, of course. Uh, Memel is the the uh, most important regional city uh, in Samogentia. It's right on the coast, so it's the kind of uh, staple uh, which holds Lithuanian or Samogentian claims uh, to the coast of the Baltic in place. And you'll see in this illustration here. Uh, this is a later illustration after the Christianization of the city, but you'll see this tremendous a stockade here. The town is depicted as being inside very high walls and heavily fortified with a, a kind of ruling complex in the center. The Lithuanian name for the, this town, because uh, of course it still exists, uh, is Klapeda. I apologize for my pronunciation there. But it's important because if you possess this fortified town on the coast, then it allows you, as a Samogintian or a Lithuanian, to, to, to keep the Teutonic Knights divided between the northern Livonian Teutonic territory and the southern Prussian Teutonic territory. Uh, Vilnius, of course, uh, as, as today, was the capital of Lithuania, but it was at the extreme southeast end of Lithuanian territory. So what you have is Vilnius at one end of Lithuanian territory and then to the extreme northwest of Lithuanian territory in the Baltic, uh, you have uh, Memil or Klapida, whichever name you prefer. Now, in 1322, uh, 
the Grand Duke Lithuania, a man named Gediminas, takes it upon himself to try and push back uh, against the state Teutonic Knights, uh, particularly in the uh, northern Livonian territories. He perceives this to be the kind of weak side of the t the weak half of the two areas of Teutonic control. And it, it's important to remember that by this time, uh, despite being pagan, the Lithuanians had organized themselves into a recognizable uh, a recognizable medieval state with an aristocracy, uh, with systems of land holding and provisioning that can produce an army and support it in the field with various supplies and goods, that there are roads developed, and that there had been trading between the Lithuanians and the Teutonic Knights right the way through this period. So we're not talking about, in any sense, a primitive society, just one that hadn't yet Christianized. Well, the Lithuanians see a, a, uh, think they see an on opportunity to undermine the Teutonic Knights by hitting them in the north, uh, in Livonia, where they have fewer men and resources. And so from 1322, there are a series of attacks on Livonia uh, all the way up uh, the north to Estonia. And in fact, uh, he uh, uh, travels down to the mouth uh, of the Niemen and he uh, uh, captures a memo which has been, uh, oh, I've screwed that all up. Haven't I? So at this point, the Lithuanians are the only pagan people left uh, on the Baltic. Uh, in fact, the only pagan peoples left in Europe at this time. Now, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania is not just uh, some kind of pagan uh, tribe. You know, by the time we get to the 14th century, the Duchy of Lithuania has developed into uh, a medieval state. Uh, it's got, uh, you know, a capital at Vilnius. It's got uh, regular systems of land holding, tax collection. It can raise an army. It can supply that army in the field. Whilst it might be somewhat poor and uh, a bit less technologically advanced than their German neighbors in the state of the Tonic Knights, they are a formidable uh, force. And they're able to hold their own against the Tonic Knights, in part due to the kind of uh, uh, forced fastness of inner Lithuania. Um, Vilnius, of course, is in the extreme southeast of Lithuanian territory, uh, as far from the Baltic as you can get. So it's it's a, a effectively a, a Baltic state with an inland uh, capital, which makes it somewhat unique. Now, because the state of Teutonic Order had this problem of uh, Lithuanian Samogintian lands separating the uh, Livonian Order of the Knights in the north from the Prussian Order of the Knights in the south, they're always really keen uh, to get hold of the bit of territory in between. Now, their attempts to do so uh, between the late 13th century and the uh, Battle of Tannenberg or Grunwald in 1410 comprise what broadly we call the Lithuanian Crusade, the sort of continuous regular warfare against the uh, pagan Lithuanians. Now, this tends to take place uh, in two annual sets of raids. So in the summer, uh, lots of people who want to go on crusade from Germany or England and other places turn up uh, in the state of Tonic Nights when it's relatively hot and dry and the land is uh, and roads are uh, firm and easy to get wagons and horses across and they will raid against the Lithuanians. There are also smaller winter raids uh, or rizas. Rizas is old word for raid. And in the winter they'll they'll raid into Lithuania when the ground is frozen hard and the waterways and ponds are frozen in January and February and you can move goods across the frozen ground. In the spring or the fall, raids aren't as possible because it's wet, uh, the soil's soft, everything turns to mud and you can't move people around. This pattern of summer and winter raising uh, is a pattern of warfare dictated by the environment in large part that's been going on in the Baltic for hundreds of years prior to the arrival of the Teutonic Knights, uh, but they carry on with it. Now, really from early 1305, the Teutonic Knights raid lands uh, around the Niemen on their winter raid. And from that point forward in early 14th century, there are nearly annual attacks on Lithuanian Samogintia uh, year on year. 
they managed to establish, the Stalactites managed to establish from 1452 uh, a fortress, a town that they call Memel. Uh, in modern Lithuania, it's called Klepida. It, it's a town just at that point where the Lithuanian lands extend out to the Baltic coast. Now, this fort is created by the Teutonic Knights in an attempt to create a land bridge between their northern lands in Livonia and their southern lands uh, in the Prussian part of the Teutonic state. So this fort becomes a real focus of contention, and it's very difficult. Uh, the Teutonic Knights can supply it from the sea, but they never really contain any inland hinterland around it. it it's, it's almost isolated all, at all times. Uh, by, by uh, uh, the hostile neighboring Samogintian or Lithuanian environment. Now, in the year 1322, a, a sort of rising, uh, uh, rising star of Lithuania, the, the Grand Duke uh, Gediminas, who, who manages to organize and mobilize the Lithuanians perhaps better than his predecessors, he decides he's going to uh, trundle up to the Baltic coast, and he is going to capture uh, Memel. I give you here a 15th century illustration of Memel at the right of this slide. Uh, you'll see here the, the kind of, uh, well, first you'll see in the foreground water, uh, there's a, a, a man-made or partially man-made island on the water with a, a uh, fort in the center of it. You'll see it here with administrative buildings. This later illustration, of course, has a, a, a church uh, and so forth. Uh, Memel for the Teutonic Knights is a trading outpost where they can trade with the natives. Trade does go on uh, throughout this period with pagans, but the town can't really develop too much because it's constantly uh, in danger of destruction. Uh, and this comes about uh, in a particularly bad episode when Gediminas raises his army and in 1322 decides to head out to the coast and besiege and ultimately capture and sack Memel. At that time, Memel is being manned by a, a, a garrison of, of Teutonic Knights from the northern Livonian territories of the Teutonic Knights. Uh, now, this takes place in, in the spring and summer of uh, in the summer of 1323. So it begins in winter of 22. By the spring and summer of 1323, a Lithu Lithuanian army has uh, besieged and uh, ultimately captured the town. Uh, they also devastate uh, what areas around it had been uh, in any ways colonized by uh, Germanic colonizers. Now, they don't hold on to it very long. Uh, by 1328, well, not very long in the long in the grand scheme of history, but certainly a long time if, if you were trying to, to survive there, I suppose, as a colonist. But by 1328, uh, Memel had come back into the hands of the Teutonic Knights, re-establishing uh, to some extent their fragile land bridge between northern and southern territories. And this time, it's, uh, it's staffed and manned by a garrison from the more prosperous, better equipped southern Prussian territories of the state Teutonic Knights. Now, it's important to understand that that this episode has a, a, a sort of shocking, uh, a shocking effect on the state Teutonic order. This is this is one of their first big setbacks uh, after the putting down of the 13th century rebellions back in Prussia, and those were sort of peasant rebellions. This is this is the Teutonic force uh, suffering a, a real defeat at the hands of the the pagan Lithuanians for the first time. It's it's said that twenty thousand Christians are killed or captured. That's probably an overestimate. Uh, and of course, because the uh, pagan Lithuanians uh, employ slavery, not only are these Christians killed and captured, but they're enslaved. Uh, now the knights take back the city by arriving with. Uh, you know, arriving with crusaders, you know, who have turned up for the summer, who lend their support. Uh, but it's too late for those Christians who have been led into slavery, which is, is perceived to be the, the kind of worst of all ends of your Christian to be enslaved uh, to a pagan. And uh, the knights who have been attacked 
not only here at Memel, but throughout Livonia and Estonia, which are perceived by the Lithuanians to be you know, vulnerable areas separated from the wealthier, better equipped Prussian areas, the Teutonic Knights. Uh, uh, I mean, the Knights really struggled to get the situation under control. And in the end, to do so, they have to make an alliance with the Russian Republic of Novgorod, uh, which are the eastern uh, neighbors of the Livonian uh, Teutonic Knights. But of course, if you recall back in 1242, in the so-called Battle on the Ice on Lake Chud, Alexander Nevsky of the Republic of Novgorod uh, had fought a, a battle against the Teutonic Knights as they had then tried to uh, expand into uh, Russian territory in the mid-13th century. In fact, the, the Teutonic Knights had long claimed that the uh, Orthodox Christians uh, could be crusaded against or ought to be crusaded against in the same way as pagans. That's to say the Teutonic Knights had a long time policy of saying, uh, you know, killing Orthodox Christians was fair, fair game because Orthodox Christians aren't proper Christians. And so it's, it's a real come down that they have to actually make an alliance with the Orthodox Russians of Novgorod uh, in order to, uh, you know, reestablish firm control over the Livonian territories. Gedebinus is a real uh, character. He's a real, uh, if you were a Lithuanian, he, he's a kind of real hero. So out of this uh, comes a response uh, a pope, from the Pope. Uh, pope John the Twenty Second issues a new crusading bull. Uh, that's to say, a new uh, order of crusade, order calling a crusade, trying to uh, round up more people to go and help the, the Teutonic Knights fight against the Lithuanians. Uh, it's valid uh, from June 1325 to uh, 1328. It offers a remission of sins to fight pagans and Orthodox Christians, uh, which of course is, is a, a quite a funny thing because it's really only with the help of Orthodox uh, Christians from uh, Orthodox Russians from Novgorod that the Teutonic Knights end up being in a real reestablished control uh, over the Livonian Northern territories. Uh, Lithuanians, uh, under Grand Duke Gediminas, uh, and uh, t excuse me, t uh, together with excuse me, uh, together with the King of Poland, uh, King uh, Vladislav, uh, both to invade uh, Mazovia. Now this uh, requires a little bit of explanation. If you'll recall, uh, uh, the Duchy of Mazovia is that area of Poland. It's a semi-autonomous area of Poland just on the southern border of the state of the Teutonic Knights. In fact, it had been uh, Conrad, Duke of Masovia, that had invited the Teutonic Knights to invade Prussia to help secure Masovia. Well, by this, this point in time, the uh, uh, Pius dynasty in Poland has fractured into many uh, different groups, and there are several competing claims uh, to be king of Poland, and Mazovia has uh, drifted off as a kind of semi-independent area, which is perceived as a threat by the king of Poland. And so when the king of Poland uh, comes north to uh, get Mazovia back under control, to, to force them to bend the knee, as they would say in Game of Thrones talk, uh, in fact, the, the Lithuanians under Gediminas also assist the king of Poland in uh, getting Mazovia under control. So what you have here is a strange situation where the, the Catholic Polish king is actually accepting assistance from the uh, pagan Lithuanian duke to secure control over northern Poland. Now all of this goes to say that, that Gediminas in particular was a man of many seasons and he has a long reign by medieval standards. He's Grand Duke from 1315 to 1341. In fact, at one point, he actually accepts baptism, uh, but then he later were, later rejects it, probably because uh, he we would we think maybe he accepted baptism rather publicly to uh, uh, smooth various negotiations with Christians and also to test the waters about how his own uh, nobles would feel about that. Uh, but when it looks like uh, they'd rather stick with their pagan ways, he rejects 
uh, he rejects his uh, Latin baptism. Now, the city of Riga, and here's another sort of really shocking turn, the city of Riga at one point actually invites him to take control of the city. Uh, and it, it takes a year for the Livonian uh, knights to drive him out. Now, this probably happens because at this time, uh, uh, Gediminas is, is raising hell in the Livonian state Teutonic knights. The knights themselves seem unable to get the situation under control. The city authorities had long had a fractious relationship with the state, the Teutonic knights. And uh, faced with uh, what seemed like the likelihood of Gediminas getting to Riga and sacking and destroying it, as he had uh, memo, uh, they actually offer up the place to him uh, voluntarily. And as I say, it takes a year for the Livonian Knights to drive he and his administrators out. So he he's a real uh, mover and shaker of the time. In fact, he even petitions Pope John the Twenty Second for protection, uh, saying. Oh, I actually did accept baptism. I'm a Christian now. I'd like some protection uh, from my nasty crusading neighbors. Uh, he, he is uh, held to be the founder of Vilnius, Lithuanian capital. In reality, uh, Vilnius had probably existed as a trading settlement considerably before then. As I mentioned, there, there's certainly an aristocratic uh, manor complex there. Might well have been folk probably really was folk functioning as uh, something like a capital before he quote unquote founds Vilnius. But this idea of him founding Vilnius is, is quite important because uh, what he does is sets out a town in the sense that towns have been created by Teutonic Knights in uh, Livonia at Riga or in the Prussian state at Torun or Gdansk or other places. That's to say, he says, this exact area of earth will be a town. He invites in Germanic Hansa traders to set up in his new uh, quote unquote foundation so that he has a, a hub of trade that can make him richer, which will help him afford more soldiers and equipment to fight his enemies. So we see here the kind of rise of Lithuania uh, under the Grand Duke uh, Gedminas. So what matters from all this? Well, the, the message that pagans are no longer primitive or heathens. Uh, Teutonic Knights are also no longer a bulwark against pagans. They can uh, certainly can be tricked or defeated or trumped by the Lithuanians, and they even have to fall back on making deals with their orthodox neighbors at one point. Uh, and in the midst of, of all of this, uh, they're probably saved. The Teutonic Knights are probably saved from the rising power of Lithuania and the capacity of the Duke of Lithuania to work effectively with his neighbors against them by the arrival uh, of the Black Death. Just before the Black Death, 1345 to 47, there are massive Lithuanian raids and then joint Lithuanian-Russian raids into Livonia. It looks like the whole thing might might come apart for the Teutonic Knights. They might lose all of their northern territory. There are also Lithuanian raids with Polish assistance. Keep in mind that deal Gediminas had made with uh, Vladislav, king of Poland, to uh, jointly secure Mazovia on the Prussian border. Well, after that, there are Polish-Lithuanian raids uh, into Prussia. Thousands of Prussians are taken to Lithuania as uh, prisoners and slaves. Uh, and by Prussians here, we mean a com both a combination of ethnic Prussians and by this time, uh, Germanic settlers of Prussia. So again, it looks like the wheels are going to come off, but the Black Death arrives in 1348-49. Uh, we probably, it's estimated that we have a, a lesser mortality rate on the Baltic than we did in densely populated areas of England and France, but it's still probably at least one in three people uh, succumbs to plague. Now this kind of dampens down everything. People don't have time to worry about uh, petty wars uh, when they're just trying to stay alive. Just at this time, we get a new Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights, uh, Vinrik von uh, Gnipr. 
oh, I can't say this, I always struggle with it, uh, Vindrich uh, von Niprod, uh, from 1351 uh, to 1382. Now, what you'll see on the right here is a statue uh, of him uh, within uh, Malberg Castle, but it's it's actually a kind of later reimagining of what he might have looked at. What you find in Malberg Castle are a whole series of statues representing the various uh, grandmasters of the order, uh, but they're all later reimaginings that try and put period appropriate dress on imagined figures. Uh, so it's more symbolic than anything else. Don't take this as a real representation. Now, uh, Niprod is a a much better tactician and planner than his predecessors. And he realizes that, that actually they are vulnerable. That there is no, uh, you know, sort of predestined path to inevitable victory for the Tronic Knights. What he decides to do is to set about seriously fortifying what the Teutonic Knights have. He says, there's a danger of losing what we've already got. There's no point in looking towards further conquests. Let's batten down the hatches. Uh, let's uh, cast up cast up a stonework walls. We'll, we'll re-fortify and improve our castles. Uh, we will you know, dig ditches, put up palisades, so on and so forth. He's also very good at siege craft. And so he understands how to capture enemy positions that have been sieged better than his predecessors. He, he organizes a reserve of unpaid knights and crusaders, uh, and he, by doing so, avoids the constraints and costs of paying for a standing uh, mercenary force. So he manages to, to find ways to save money, he invests that money in fortification. He also creates a 90 mile wide buffer zone uh, between the Prussian state, the Teutonic Knights, uh, and the Lithuanians. And so you might recall in that map I showed earlier, there was a kind of big hash mark area around the edges of the Lithuanian territory uh, that thrusts in into Teutonic lands. But that hash, hash mark area represents this kind of buffer zone. And it really is a kind of no man's land. You know, you can't, can't throw up a wall around your whole kingdom. Uh, and so what you do is you depopulate an area with a kind of scorched earth policy. He plays off the Polish dukes uh, against their overbearing uh, King Kazimir III. I've already mentioned the, the way in which uh, uh, King Wladyslaw had, had come up uh, into Mazovia to put down you know, the sort of two independent Mazovian princes. Well, that that's a little scary to other Polish uh, barons who say, hey, you know, maybe we're giving too much power to the king. Uh, and so uh, Kazimir III's successor is perceived to be quite, you know, uh, quite a, a problematic character. He's referred to as the great, but at the same time, if you were his enemy, he was probably more like the, the terrifying or terrible. And so uh, uh, Niprod manages to, to, to kind of dabble in Polish politics, lending support, at least tacitly, to one person or another uh, to uh, keep the Poles off balance. He then does the, exactly the same thing by exploiting familial divisions and rivalries within Lithuania by offering tacit support or at least uh, relief from conflict for various uh, Lithuanian nobles. In 1366, there's the so-called Peace of Danzig uh, between the Bishop of Riga and the Livonian, uh, Livonian Teutonic Knights. Keep in mind that uh, Riga had been founded by the Bishop of Riga, uh, who, who, who still had a lot of control in Livonian affairs, even though he, he was effectively sharing power with the state of the Teutonic Knights. Now, this uh, agreement between the Bishop of Riga and the Teutonic Knights of Livonia allows for uh, the Knight Brothers to extract military service from citizens. Now, th this, again, it saves money because you no longer have to hire in mercenaries to supplement the soldiery of the Teutonic Order in Livonia. It also means that uh, you can feel confident you've got a, res a reserve of last defenders available to you. Uh, this kind of, again, comes about from a realization on behalf of the 
fish up that the Teutonic Knights are not invincible and that uh, rather than working against them or undermining them, he better help them out. Uh, otherwise, they might be defeated, and if they're defeated, then he could lose everything as well. Now, by 1382, it looked like uh, von Niprod had systematically taken Samogintia one bite at a time. What happens throughout his reign of 1315 to 1382, sorry about that background noise there. So uh, Gediminas manages through this kind of, uh, excuse me, uh, von Niprod manages through this uh, kind of long period of careful uh, maneuvering and playing off one party against another to uh, slowly conquer most of Samogintia. Uh, and to secure that land bridge between the Livonian uh, and Prussian parts of the state's Teutonic Knights in a more expansive uh, and secure way than he than had been achieved before. So effectively, uh, softly, softly, under uh, his guidance, proves to be more effective than the previous 50 years of hot conflict had been. The problem is, uh, after his time, this all begins to unravel. Uh, from about 1380, the Lithuanians, uh, the Lithuanians and the Russians become allies uh, for the purpose of defeating the uh, Mongol Golden Horde. Uh, now, this is a famous event in Russian history. Uh, of course, the the uh, uh, of course of course the uh, the Mongols and the Golden Horn, excuse me, Golden Horde, represent the the fighting force of the the sort of northwest Khanate of the Mongol Empire. So, and the, the, the uh, Eastern uh, Russians had for a long time effectively been, been subject to the influence of the Mongols. So the Lithuanians and the Russians together managed to battle off uh, the Mongols in a set piece, a pitched battle, uh, the so-called uh, uh, Battle of Kulikov. Now, this kind of cements a good relations between the Lithuanians and Russians in a way that they had not previously existed. And this comes hard on the heels of uh, uh, Yeglonia, a Lithuanian Grand Duke, coming to power in 1377, and it, it proceeds by only a short bit, uh, 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 excuse me, Yogalia, uh, it proceeds by only a short period of time, Yogalia's a marriage to a Yadviga, or a Hedvig is the other way in which her name is pronounced, a princess uh, of Poland. And so uh, this creates a dynastic union uh, between the Poles and the Lithuanians. Yogalia actually becomes, through his marriage to Jadwiga, a king of Władysław uh, II, Yogalia of Poland, uh, from 1386, and he converts to Christianity. And this time, unlike the kind of tentative, uh, temporary, false conversion of Gediminas, Yogalia's conversion is uh, is a permanent affair. He becomes a, a, a proper anointed Christian king of Europe, providing a, presiding over a dynastic union of Poland-Lithuania. And from 1387, he pushes a, a, a top-down, uh, centralized uh, or centrally sponsored conversion of the Lithuanians that involves, uh, you know, supporting uh, missionary priests going into the countryside, the building of parish churches, and so forth. Now, this Polish-Lithuanian union, though uh, now long uh, forgotten uh, to modern memory, it actually creates one of the largest and most enduring political entities of early modern Europe. Poland and Lithuania together uh, comprised uh, 450,000 square miles of territory, and the Polish-Lithuanian Union uh, exists from 1386 all the way up until 1795, uh, at which time uh, Poland would be uh, 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 carved up between the Russians and the Germans. But that's an extraordinary period of time, you know, uh, uh, over 400 years when we have a, 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 a Polish-Lithuanian state with a lot of manpower, a lot of resources. 
And it's this combined Polish-Lithuanian entity, which from 1386 uh, faces the state, the Teutonic Knights. Not only does it uh, uh, surround the, the southern and eastern, most of the eastern border of the areas of the Teutonic Knights, of course, that area of land uh, comprising Samogintia, that, that land which was to now partially conquered uh, by the Teutonic Knights, uh, has a long history and heritage of being part of Lithuania. It, it sits there like a wedge between the northern Livonian lands of the Knights and their southern, uh, and their southern lands in Prussia. In 1409, uh, there is rebellion in Teutonic held Samogintia. So uh, the lands around uh, Memel, uh, creating a land bridge between the Livonian and Prussian parts of the state Teutonic Knights, which had been uh, progressively conquered and colonized by the Teutonic Knights uh, under von Niprod, they go into rebellion, a rebellion which is probably spurred on uh, with the encouragement of the newly invigorated uh, uh, Lithuanians under the Polish-Lithuanian Union. Uh, and of course, as soon as they go into rebellion, uh, in classic fashion, uh, Poland-Lithuania intervenes to support them in their plight uh, against the uh, so you know, supposedly oppressive forces of the Teutonic Knights. At this time, uh, you know, it is that uh, Duke of Lithuania, uh, Yogala, Yogalia, who is uh, also king of Poland. And so, of course, as an ethnic Lithuanian, he's quite keen to get behind their cause and has knowledge of the long struggle of the Lithuanians against the Knights for that territory. Now, because Yogalia has moved on to be a king of United Poland-Lithuania, uh, there is also a... Uh, uh, now a separate Duke of Lithuania, uh, Eugalia's grandson, uh, Vitatus the Great. And he too throws his weight uh, on a domestic basis uh, behind the, the rebelling uh, Samogintian, uh, Samogintian nobility. Now, this at this time, we have a grandmaster Teutonic Knight named Ulrich von uh, Junginen, and he uh, he's a pugnacious character, and he seizes upon this opportunity to declare war on Poland-Lithuania. There's much discussion of what, what his mentality is at this point. Is he thinking, you know, I need to deal with this new threat of a united Poland-Lithuania, you know, up front? Uh, does he genuinely feel that he has the upper hand because of the long martial heritage of the Teutonic Knights. Uh, it's hard to tell what exactly he's thinking, uh, but he takes the opportunity to escalate, in effect, escalate the war beyond the conflict in Samogintia, and he attacks a Bidgosht, uh, which is only about uh, you know, 40, uh, 30, 40 miles west of Torun. Uh, it's just on the Polish side of that Prussian-Polish uh, border. Uh, on the southern edge of Prussian uh, er areas of the Teutonic state. So he attacks Bidgosht, he takes the town. Uh, initially, it looks like a successful raid, but then he's later driven out. And, and this is a, a, a frighteningly quick turnaround for the new Grand Master. So he goes back and raises as large an army as he can uh, back in uh, the Prussian part of the state of Teutonic Knights. At the same time, uh, Eugalia does the same. He raises a Polish-Lithuanian army, and the two meet in a pitched battle. And again, pitched battles are, are quite rare affairs in the Middle Ages. Uh, he meets in a pitched battle at Grunwald on the 15th of July, uh, 1410. This is a slightly uh, later uh, ink, I think it's a woodcut illustration of the Battle of Grunwald, where you can see the two armies uh, lined up on either side here. Some interesting little bits here. You can see the very long pikes, which are associated, you know, becoming increasingly associated with warfare as we move towards the 1500s. The Teutonic Knights lose this battle. The Grand Master and his top officials are taken captive. And in a sense, it's almost the uh, captivity of the Grand Master that's more 
problematic than, than, than being driven off the field because, of course, that, that leaves the strike order uh, in the short term without leadership. Uh, it means that he, there's a potential of having to, to, to ransom him back at great expense, you know, crippling expense potentially to the state of the Tyke Knights. The uh, Polish Lithuanian army moves north uh, about halfway to the sea on a, a line from, from Bydgoszcz to the Baltic. Uh, they reach Malburg, the capital of the state, the Tonic Knights. And it says something about the fragility of the state and the severity of the defeat at Grunwald. They're pushed quickly back uh, to their main stronghold. Uh, and there is a, a siege of Malburg, but but fortunately for the Tonic Knights, the siege fails uh, due to an outbreak of dysentery in the Polish-Lithuanian army and a kind of fear that they're deep in uh, Teutonic Prussian territory and they don't quite know uh, how quickly an enemy force uh, will be raised to lift the siege and they don't want to get caught out in enemy territory. Now, Grunwald has a, a legacy as be, of being one of the largest a set piece battles in the Middle Ages uh, with possibly 25,000 soldiers fighting in the Lithuanian, Polish Lithuanian army and 15,000 in the Army of the Teutonic Knights. Uh, you know, so that's, that's maybe 40,000 uh, men engaged in battle. Now, again, that's uh, in the top sort of 10% numerically, the ten, top 10% 10 of largest uh, land battles in the late Middle Ages. The result is that after a period of skirmishes and uh, uh, skirmishes and uh, negotiations, by February 1411, the two sides uh, decide to make an agreement, and they make an agreement at uh, Torun, where we'll be visiting, of course, because it's on the River Wisła, it's right on the border between Poland and Prussia. They meet there and agree the so-called Peace of Thorn, uh, or Peace of Torun, Thorn, of course, being the German name for Torun. In uh, this is agreed in on 1st February 1411 with the payment of a hundred thousand uh, Prague prog crowns. That's to say, about forty-four thousand pounds of gold to be paid over uh, to the Polish-Lithuanian monarchy for the release of fourteen thousand POWs from the uh, state of the Teutonic Knights and to have peace. They're only given four years to pay. And this is a sum of money which is, is roughly 10 times the English king's annual income. And, and there's a, a long uh, history or legacy of the kind of stripping of a, a century of wealth from the state of the Teutonic Order. To come up with this money, you know, there are stories of emptying and raiding churches, taking their silver, precious metals, uh, putting heavy taxes on, on the various towns of uh, the state of the Teutonic Knights. I mean, this is a real, what, what we call in modern language, a fire sale where everything must go uh, to come up with this money in that short a period of time. Some of the major urban settlements, Torun and Gdansk, for example, rebel against the high taxes uh, that they're being asked to pay. And I give you down here an image at the bottom of a, a Teutonic penny. This uh, uh, sort of humble silver penny was the main currency of the time, uh, but it's likely that this vast payment was paid over not just in minted coins but probably also in uh, in raw gold and silver. This is the end of the Crusades. Uh, the so-called Lithuanian Crusade, the, the battle between the uh, uh, Teutonic Knights of Lithuanians is perceived to have ended with the Battle of Tannenberg or more generously with the 1411 uh, first piece of Torun. What you have after this is a kind of semi-resolved conflict where just as the state of Tonic Knight had spent uh, decades uh, picking away at the territory and authority of the Lithuanians, this now goes into reverse. And so uh, we have a kind of uh, war of attrition here. And one of, the, one of the most important aspects of this is the fact uh, that Water transport is the easiest way to move goods and military equipment from one point to another. Now, all of the rivers in the, the Baltic Basin, of course, flow into the Baltic Sea. And because the, the territories of the state, the Teutonic Knights, are on the sea, it means that if you start off in Poland or Lithuania, uh, you can load 
by this time heavy military equipment cannon are in regular use for the 1400s you can load cannon and heavy equipment men horses even onto boats or barges and quickly move them down river to forts uh, which again are typically located on the water to forts uh, possessed by the Teutonic Knights you could use your your uh, sort of rapid attack downstream force and their cannon and so forth to drive out the Teutonic Knights the problem is when the Teutonic Knights want to bring an army up to defend their possessions or lift those sieges they're headed upriver and so that requires uh, sailing punting rowing uh, and oftentimes because of current it's just not possible to move uh, the weight and volume of goods they need to up up river the goods have to come overland which is slow laborious and ineffective and so they're at a terrible disadvantage and, and it's particularly cannon uh, in the possession of the Polish Lithuanian army that allows them to exploit this quickly move heavy cannon down waterways to attack uh, completely obliterate fortification and then they begin the slow uh, retreat upriver uh, as the Teutonic Knights are just starting to make their way upriver to the point that they wished to defend. There's another important aspect to the end of the crusade here. There's a papal council is held between 1414 and 1418. So this is just three years after the, the Peace of Thorn. And at this council, the Lithuanians turn up, you know, uh, and they turn up and they say, look, we're, we're now a Christian nation. In fact, we're in a union with, you know, with long Catholic Poland. And they challenge the very notion that the Teutonic Knights ought to be allowed to expand uh, territory by force. In fact, they, they question even the notion that they ought to be able to extend, expand territory by force against pagans. And this is the end of the crusading movement more generally in Europe. I mean, they argue that war and pagans ought only be allowed if the pagans were aggressive toward Christians, uh, if it's for the gain of Christian territory, they, 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 uh, or if, if the war on pagans uh, attacks those who've shamed the Creator, they, they want to have rules of conduct here, even against pagans. And most importantly, they say, we ourselves are no longer pagans. You know, we're Christians. How can you fight against us now? Surely. Surely that ought to rule out war on Pol on Christian Poland, Lithuania, and that equally they argue Orthodox Russians ought not be targeted just because they have a different version of Christianity. And whilst after a long period of argument and discussion, the Council of Constance very, very tepidly reaffirms the right of the Teutonic Order to exist and continue to fight against uh, non-Christians where it's sensible to do so. Uh, the reality is it's a Pyrrhic victory for the Teutonic Knights and most people go away from the Council of Constance saying actually this isn't sensible, God's not really going to prove of this, you know, cr crusading against pagans or crusading in the Baltic is a dead letter. And so whilst on the surface of it the Council of Constance confirms the existence, continued existence of the Teutonic Knights, uh, it's such a Pyrrhic victory that, in, in fact, it kind of spells the end of broad acceptance of what they're doing. Crusaders quit coming every summer to crusade in the Baltic. I mean, who are they going to crusade against? Other Christians in Poland, Lithuania? It doesn't make sense. Uh, and so the so-called so noble struggle against paganism is, is effectively over from this point. And I'll wrap up just by showing you this image here. This is a view from... Uh, uh, Satria Hill, uh, and this is referred to sometimes as the guardian of Samogintia, this hill. This, this is the beginning of a, an area of elevated landscape, uh, traditionally in Lithuanian control, that looks out over the, the vast uh, forest fastness that stretches from uh, the elevated interior of Samogintia out to the Baltic coast. Uh, so it's interesting, I, I just want to kind of put yourself in the shoes at the end of this lecture of the Lithuanians in their fight back because this is a, a hill that would actually have been manned by Lithuanian uh, soldiers or sentries looking out for the Teutonic Knights on the horizon.